Citizen Kane is the most important, greatest American film as far as I'm concerned. This is the gold standard here. It's pretty hard to top Citizen Kane. Citizen Kane is the greatest movie ever made. Is that really your idea of how to run a newspaper? I don't know how to run a newspaper, Mr. Thatcher. I just try everything I can think of. There's never been a film that I'm aware of that if you watch it for the 138th time, you can still see something new that you hadn't noticed before. I made no campaign promises because until a few weeks ago, I had no hope of being elected. <laughs> now, however, I have something more than a hope. And Jim Geddes, Jim Geddes has something less than a chance. Every single, not just every scene, but every shot has an idea. There's a concept and an idea being executed at every second of that film. There's this extraordinary performance which people seem to take for granted. I mean, Orson ages from 25 to 85 in this movie, and he's totally believable in every phase of it. Rosebud. Orson Welles was brilliant. I mean, uh, and that was like his first film, and he was 26 years old. It is just one of the great movies ever made, and I think many people are going to agree it's just one of the great american experiences throw that junk Citizen Kane will always be something that demands attention and respect and admiration for uh, another way of looking at the world through, through the cinematic eye. The story told through this dense and complicated array of techniques is an investigation into a man's life. Kane is seen not simply at different stages of his life, a bravura piece of acting by the 25-year-old Wells, but also through the eyes and the testimony of different witnesses. In fact, which came first? Was it the story of Citizen Kane, or was it the idea of looking at a life? That was what came first. But my co-author, Mankiewicz, took off with me on the idea of making it based on some big American figure. And we thought of a president. That was because Hughes had got us started thinking that way. I wasn't going to have played Hughes because I wouldn't have been good in it. It was going to be Cotton who would have played Hughes. And uh, we said, well, let's get a part I can play. And uh, before we decided what sort of big man it would be, well, we began on this idea of seeing it from various points of view. And the original scripts, or at least storylines, had much more dramatic differences of point of view. It was much more of a trick. It was much more Rashomon than it ended up being. For instance, a man who hated him, he would then see a scene in which Cain was totally hateful. Somebody who loved him, you would see him totally lovable. And that isn't so in the movie, you know? We, we see what he is all the time, I think, or at least we tried to do it. Charge, you know perfectly well, there's not the slightest proof that this Armada's off the Jersey Hello, coast. Hello, Mr. Bernstein. Excuse me, Mr. Bernstein. Can you prove it isn't? This just Mr. Bernstein, in. I'd like you to meet Mr. Thatcher. I'll just How do you do, Mr. Thatcher? Leland, uh, Mr. Thatcher, my ex-guardian. We have no secrets from our readers, Mr. Bernstein. Mr. Thatcher is one of our most devoted readers. He knows what's wrong with every copy of the Inquirer since I took over. Read the cable. Girls delightful in Cuba, stop. Could send you prose poems about scenery, but don't feel right spending your money. Stop. There is no war in Cuba. Signed, Wheeler. Any answer? Yes, dear Wheeler, you provide the prose poems. I'll provide the war. You said once that Cain seemed to you to have been really quite close to parody as a character. You said once he was rather close to burlesque. I didn't know if you meant the way you played him or the way he was conceived. I don't know what I meant by that. Maybe that comes from one of those foreign language interviews where I pretend I understand the question and say, yes, you know. <laughs> There's a whole lot of things I'm supposed to have said that really come from me not hearing very well or not being as good a linguist as I pretend to be. 
What most people thought Wells had in mind was a real-life newspaper tycoon, the biggest of them all, William Randolph Hearst, the baron of the yellow press and one of the most powerful men in America. Look first at the description of Citizen Kane's fictional palace, Xanadu, from the March of Time sequence. Here on the deserts of the Gulf Coast, a private mountain was commissioned and successfully built. 100,000 trees, 20,000 tons of marble are the ingredients of Xanadu's mountain. Contents of Xanadu's palace. Paintings, pictures, statues, the very stones of many another palace. A collection of everything. So big it can never be catalogued or appraised. Enough for ten museums. The loot of the world. Xanadu's livestock. The fowl of the air. The fish of the sea. The beast of the field and jungle. Two of each. The biggest private zoo since Noah. What are you doing? Oh, one thing I never can understand, Susan. How do you know you haven't done it before? Makes a whole lot more sense than collecting statues. You may be right. I sometimes wonder. When did he get the the RKO deal? Because that's an extraordinary deal. Is that pretty soon after War of the Worlds? Is there anything of significance before that? Or? Well, the only thing really of significance, I mean, he was busy certainly with radio and he was, you know, Mercury Theater and Campbell Playhouse was big news. But at the time, the initial idea was that he was going to do Heart of Darkness and make that a film. That's right, yeah. That was his, that was his original thought. And they were in pre-production. There's... Photos taken, publicity photos of Orson around this time with his goatee and his pipe. Mm. Uh, that was going to be his new look. And he did it on radio. They did an adaptation of Heart of Darkness. He mentions on the radio adaptation that this was originally thought, you know, this was going to be the first film they were going to do. But somewhere around there, it turned into Kane. Mm. So this RKO deal, according to Orson, it wasn't so much that he got a lot of money. It was that he got final cut. Correct. It seems crazy, you know, for someone yeah. in his mid twenties. We've got obviously the Brando link because um, Brando was in Apocalypse Now, which is a somewhat of an adaptation mm-hmm. of Heart of Darkness. Did he get this deal through hustling? Do we know any of the backstory there? No, not necessarily. He had just made. Mm. He'd become such a sensation. Mm. You know, it's like anybody. It's like um, you know somebody who does something crazy on the internet and then suddenly gets a record deal you know (laughs) he had already had that tremendous success which was known all over the country you know on broadway so he was already known as this tremendous you know he's like the theater director of our age Mm -hmm. and now he had already he had made this big splash in radio so why wouldn't he be able to do film Mm -hmm. and because he had that reputation of he was not necessarily, I don't think people were calling him a genius. Well, actually, I think they did. <laughs> In the right. uh, Orson Welles, H.G. Uh, Wells, I think they uh, referred v- to him as a genius. Yes, v- Wunderkind. Wunderkind. Possibly right. the only word of German that anyone, yes. uh, some people ever know. <laughs> but, yeah, so the, the thought was that he would be able to you know, bring his same genius to filmmaking. Mm. And from what I understand, a lot of Hollywood directors were not happy that he was given all this power immediately without earning it. But... Sure. So it was. You know, Arkea was a big studio, but it wasn't in the same league as Warner Brothers or MGM, so they could kind of afford to do something like this. Okay. All right. I didn't really make any notes on Kane, because I do, I do know it pretty well. I know mm-hmm. both the film and the story. I would definitely say this reputation it has had as the greatest film ever, I think to some extent is to its... I could say to its detriment in the sense that if anyone switches on their TV and someone says, this is the greatest film ever, it's never going to live up to that. Right. Um, and in fact, I remember when I was about, I think I first saw the film when I was about 18. Again, I sort of had a similar reaction, even though I was a little bit precocious with films. I was watching Hitchcock when I was about 12 or 13 and stuff like that. But I remember thinking, it can't live up to the hype. And I 
showed it, I think, to my dad, and he watched about half an hour, and he says, is this the greatest film ever made? And he didn't mean it in a sense of th that it wasn't a good film. It's just, how is something presented as the greatest film ever? What What is the viewer expecting? Are they expecting explosions or, you know... I mean, I can believe Apocalypse Now could be called the best Vietnam War film ever because it's so epic and because it shows the confusion of war. So I think maybe people would be looking for something that's three hours or four hours or something. It's so epic that it's just going right. to blow your mind. But I would say one thing. In the era of DVDs and now Blu-rays, having DVD extras and experts, and some of them are experts, some of them aren't, pointing out things that you wouldn't have seen. I remember when I lived in Thailand, this is very random, they had flea markets all over the place. And I remember having a day off and I got this DVD of Citizen Kane and there was a film historian. It wasn't Roger Ebert, he did a commentary as well. It's another guy who had this lovely calm voice and I, I watched the film with his commentary on it and it just absolutely all made sense because he was pointing out all this <laughs> stuff I just would never have noticed. And then Barry Norman, who you may have, may have heard of, he had a very famous film program mm -hmm. sort of before Jonathan Ross. He did a documentary that's on the DVD. So I'd urge people, you know, if you fancy getting the DVD, to lap up all those extras, because there is a lot of stuff going on. And, of course, you have to know what didn't exist before. Well, that's really, the thing, yeah. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? So let's just mention, what, what are some of the virtues of, of this film? What do you reckon? Well, I mean, how highly do you rate it? Yes, I mean, I rate it pretty highly. It's not my favorite Orson Welles movie. I do mm. think that, you know, the greatest film ever made tag seems to change every 20 years or so. So yeah. certainly in the late 60s and into the early 70s, that was the general thought. That's the period of time when I think Citizen Kane was hailed as the greatest movie ever made. Sometime mm. in the mid 80s, that changed to Vertigo. Which is not even my favorite. <laughs> right. I don't understand that at all. It's a good film, but it's... Right. Uh, rear window so, I'd take, but yeah. Anyway, sorry. So yeah. these these things change over a period of time, but I do think that, you know, it's just, you figure late 60s, so they were looking back 20 years at that time, so I could see mm -hmm. where they're coming from, I suppose. But yes, it's for the innovations that came later. Although as a story, as a loosely based um, biography of... William Randolph Hearst. I think it's a compelling film. I, if anything, I think the pop psychology around it of the significance of Rosebud and the childhood and all of that probably seemed really insightful in the late 60s, early 70s. Now we kind of look at it and go, oh, it's a bit much. Yeah. What could I say about this? Yeah. I mean, those greatest ever lists. I mean, as I've got older, I just don't really take much notice of those. You know, some of those films I do love. Something like 12 Angry Men's a bit of a classic. And that's mm -hmm. quite high now up the IMDb list, which I'm quite surprised by. But it's almost bugged me a little bit that whatever Roger Ebert and Pauline Kay will say about a film seems to be what 80% of film viewers seem to think. Or just, just the power that they had to sort of say that a film was good or bad. And Pauline Kay hated Kubrick, by the way. She just used yeah. to pan all his films almost, you know, by reflex action. Well... Roger Ebert hated mm. David Lynch, who's another one of my favorite directors. Famously disliked nearly all of David Lynch's movies. So Yeah, yeah, I don't know. But, I mean, there are... I, mean, I don't remember everything that this guy pointed out on the DVD, because it's quite a long time ago, but... I mean, some of the shots are, are incredible, and there's little things like um, you can see the ceilings, which apparently might not seem like a big deal, but you, that wasn't true of most films before that. Another thing they had was have a person near the camera in sharp focus, but have the person in the background also in sharp focus. I think that's yes. right. Yep. That was one of the things. And then there's a great shot where they're interviewing Susan Alexander, who's the second wife. Right, through the, the... camera sort of goes through the roof, essentially, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, um, there's so many. That's, I think that's what, when we think about it now, we think of those great shots. You know, the, the snow, the rosebud, the dropping of the ornament snow globe. Yeah, the snow mm. globe it shatters the reflection of the nurse opening the door on the glass i mean that's that is some pretty remarkable stuff for 19 and what about so, yeah. but what about the extreme i'd forgot the extreme close-up of his lips saying the word yes I mean, yes that's pretty amazing to be honest yeah. yeah i mean nobody had seen a film like that I, a, a friend of mine is this actor, Will Hutchins, who saw Citizen Kane. He tells the story. Now, this is before, you know, Citizen Kane had the reputation. So he would see the poster for Citizen Kane, and he would look at this poster all the time and say, oh, someday soon I'm going to see this movie. One of these mm. days, you know, my 
family's going to take me to see that. I can't wait. Someday I'll see it. Someday I'll see it. And then eventually it was playing in a theater and he said, it lived up to everything, it lived up to my imagination. So I think it does live up to its reputation. I don't know, again, greatest movie ever made. There've been so many movies made since. Values change over time. Things that were once seen as revolutionary have just become so commonplace. Yes. So who knows? You know, it's sort of like those greatest album lists. I keep watching Mm. certainly rock albums drop off those top 10 spots to be replaced by hip hop albums. Hey, you know, Mm. it happens. I'm sure there are people who have with loads of jazz records who freak out that there are no jazz artists on the top 100 albums. I consider those entertainment and uh, yeah. a rough guide to some good albums or good films, really. The other thing about presenting Citizen Kane as the greatest film ever for someone to watch once is that you really need, just for all the technical stuff, you really need to watch it a few times. I know that you're not a big fan of this phrase, oh, it ages well or it doesn't age well. And I don't mean it in a kind of woke sense, but I think some films do get better if you watch them more because there's enough in there that you're going to see things that you didn't see the first time. You and I must have talked about this a hundred times. Well, so the thing pre- that doesn't age well for me is, I think, is makeup in uh, Citizen right. Kane. Probably looked great at the time, but some of it does look ridiculous. I mean, he is the age he was, and they did their best. Mm. I think that's always a tricky situation, age makeup in movies. But, you know, it's almost like the worst film ever made. You know, for years, it was Plan 9 from Outer Space was the yeah. worst film ever made. But that movie's entertaining. I mean, the worst movie ever made would be a movie that was so boring that I'd want to leave the theater. At least with Plan 9, I'm, there's something funny going on, you know. Maybe unintentionally, but... Yeah, definitely, yeah. What's the other thing I was going to say? Yeah, with the makeup. I didn't think Orson was too bad, but Joseph Cotton, the first time I saw that, I thought, oh, that just yeah. looks ridiculous. I mean, I quite like the visor. That was a good touch. He's in a wheelchair with a visor. Yes. That, was, that was quite good. But the actual, what do you see his face? But, um, no, I mean, you, you really have to think... I think the movement, I think Orson got the sort of arthritic movement of Kane. I mean, is he yes. supposed to be in his, I guess he's in his 70s by the end, is he? 60s, 70s? I think so, yeah. Something like that. And of course, it's, is it, it'd be interesting as well to compare, to look at Orson at 70 and Kane at 70. They don't look the same. No. But, so he, and, he's doing a kind of impression, if you like. But again, to me, it almost bought into this idea that Orson was an old soul, you know, in a 25-year-old's body. That he'd almost like he'd lived a few lifetimes. It's that cl- bit of a cliche, but you know what I mean? No. I do. I, I think there's truth in that. <laughs> mm. Have you seen, I'm sure you have, the documentary, The Battle for Citizen Kane? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've, that, I've read the, I've read the highly book. Highly recommended, yeah. I've read the book. So, uh, what's it called? Citizen Kane <coughs> Companion or Citizen Kane book. Oh, the other thing I wanted to, to mention, this is quite a shocking story. You definitely would have heard of this. That Orson was in, um, he was staying in a hotel. I was lecturing in buffalo and after the lecture i was with some people having dinner and a waiter said this policeman wants to see you and i turned white i always feel guilty when policemen want to see me and the cop turned out to be very nice he said don't go back to your hotel room i said why he said they've got an underage girl undressed and photographers waiting for you it's a setup so i didn't go back to my room that night i just stayed up took the plane in the morning but that was that was as far as they were prepared to go i would have gone to jail of course they've got a 14 year old girl in your in your room and they've got some reporters ready to take photos and that's pretty yeah. hardcore i mean that would be fairly hardcore now well i mean this is i think some of the greatest movie of all time tag does rest on the controversy this film caused mm. because you were taking on one of the most powerful men in the whole country you know, someone with major political influ- influence, mm-hmm. you know, someone who's been accused of manufacturing war, or at least stirring up war hysteria. Mm-hmm. And here you had this movie that was kind of exposing these stories about this guy. And then the ultimate insider knowledge would be just the term Rosebud, which... Ah, I know where you're going. Yes, here. you're right, oh. right. Which was allegedly William Randolph Hearst's nickname for his wife's Marion Davies vagina, which the writer Herman Mankiewicz apparently knew and incorporated that into the script. And apparently that was a bridge too far for William Randolph Hearst. 
Yeah, it's a, it is fascinating. That documentary is, is great. And like I say, there is a book as well that details the whole production but yeah it's brilliant stuff i was saying earlier that kane is not epic of course it, it kind of is because you see him go from a boy it's his whole life story the other thing about it is that it's shot out of sequence and i mean i remember when pulp fiction came out in 1994 right that was considered quite revolutionary i had a story about that i was on a i was on a date and we were 45 minutes late and uh, i saw john travolta being shot by bruce willis in the toilet and then he popped up again. I was like, hmm, what's going on there? <laughs> right. I mean, it's weird that that was considered, you know, that's another 50-odd years later. But, yeah, he is shot out of sequence. And um, Woody Allen did a bit of that in Annie Hall. I mean, that I don't know how much that had been done before. That's the thing. I don't, I'm not that strong on films of the 30s and 20s and 30s. I mean, even, even having the newsreel open it probably oh, yeah. seemed, you know... And maybe that was a, a very conscious callback to the War of the Worlds to have always something to do with the news, you know, to have the the newsreel opening the um, the picture with the faked footage. And yeah, it still holds up. I mean, it's still an entertaining, uh, entertaining film. Yeah. Well, Rob Ager actually asked if he could come on the show and talk about it. So <laughs> I will do a deep dive with him at some point. Yeah, definitely. What other things? I always thought that her singing wasn't actually that bad because there's a famous scene so she's he's trying to and this is part of the tragedy of the story he's obviously trying to mold her as an opera singer and bernard right. herman who of course would go on to do the music for lots of hitchcock films and also taxi driver just before he died he actually essentially wrote an opera maybe not a whole opera but he wrote sections of an opera just especially for that but right for her to sing yeah but i always thought i don't know I don't, her singing doesn't sound terrible you know she, she might not be quite up to the mark but i don't know i think it might be that we are not well versed in that music because mm, could be, yeah. you know my uncle was an opera fanatic and i've known people that are connoisseurs of opera and i used to say well mario lanza is a good singer and they go oh my god he's terrible now to <laughs> me he sounds fantastic but they were like he he, he wouldn't last five minutes at the met you're like, okay all right whatever <laughs> so that might have been the case too i know that Orson felt some guilt over that whole sequence and that whole storyline with the actress Dorothy Cummingmore, I think her name is, mm. because Marion Davies, they sort of uh, insinuate that she is the Marion Davies character in that film. They sort of insinuate that Marion Davies was not talented and needed William Randolph Hearst to put her in pictures. And Orson said, you know, that was, a, by his own admission, he felt that was a dirty trick. Mm. Because Marion Davies was actually a very talented actress and really didn't need anybody's help. That was almost like character assassination in the film. Oh, very interesting, yeah. Last thing from me on, on this film, yeah. I, I would just urge people, if you've seen it once and you've kind of thought, oh, that's not the greatest film ever. I'm not telling you it is. Neither of us are telling you it is. We're just saying that it is a pretty quite a multi-layered film that does need a few watches to get the full effect, I think. And, you know, it, it is pretty tragic. I mean, towards the end, uh, spoiler alert, they're in this massive house. The relationship's obviously gone to pot. Mm -hmm. They put a nice kind of echo on the on the soundtrack, maybe, maybe a little bit on the nose, but uh, yeah. to show how cavernous this house is. And, and she's her hobby is doing jigsaw puzzles, so she's obviously bored and all that stuff. And um, uh, should we spoil this? Yeah, why not? No, we're not going to tell you what Rosebud is. <laughs> But all we'll tell you is that of all the possessions in his house, and he's obviously probably bought, you know, thousands and thousands of objects, be they paintings or just, just right. gadgets or whatever. And in the end, it just comes down to a childhood memory. That, yeah. You know, all that adult stuff, it's important, but perhaps in the end, it's the childhood stuff that stays with you the longest. I think that might be the message. Well, it's one of those movies, you know, as we're talking about it now, you're just, you're just reminding me and i'm reminding you of various shots and sequences and you're like oh yeah this actually is a really good movie <laughs> they often do get better the more you talk right about them. right true. you go oh yeah that is great oh yeah that's great too. yeah yeah and then you realize you've covered the entire film yeah, yeah. No, it's it's a wonderful movie it might maybe it doesn't maybe it doesn't really tug at the heartstrings i suppose you know indirectly it does i suppose at the end but mm. it's a good movie I like say think... City Lights, for example, tugs at the heartstrings. You know, I I don't think uh, Kane does in that same way. Is City Lights the one with the blind girl? Yes. Yeah. 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 I've seen most of Chaplin's the seminal stuff. 
I suppose maybe our feelings about Orson would influence the way we see Kane, because clearly, you know, there's some. You always get this, don't you? There's some of Orson in Kane, and there's some of Kane in Orson, no doubt. And it is interesting to compare, as we said, his situation at the end of his life, not necessarily with mm. looks, but to compare. Well, how how did Orson's life go compared with Kane's? I haven't done that, but maybe that's something I'll do on a rainy Sunday afternoon. <laughs> Well, I mean, I suppose there are parallels there, except Orson wound up owning nothing. <laughs> yeah, know? that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Basically living in an apartment in Hollywood. Did you want to touch upon, because you mentioned Pauline Kael before, did yes, you want so. to touch upon her attempts at demystifying Kane and taking away some of Orson's authorship? Did she write the book? She wrote the book She did. I've read. Yeah, so she wrote this book. I mean, because Herman Mankiewicz was asked to write the script mm. and Herman Mankiewicz was holed up with John Hausman, who was still working with Wells at this time, mm. to get a script in shape because I think Mankiewicz had a drinking problem so Hausman was there to kind of facilitate his sobriety, I suppose. And then basically Orson did what he always did, which is he adapted. So Mankiewicz would write the screenplay and Orson would get it and then he would change things, add scenes or what have you. At the time, Pauline Kael, I think she was with the New York Times, but the critic who was her rival was Andrew Saris from uh, Village Voice. And very popular at that time was the director as auteur theory. Mm. And Pauline Kael was very much against that. For her, it was the screenwriter who was everything. So she really wanted to showcase Herman Mankiewicz's contribution to the script at the expense of... Orson, because Orson always claimed, you know, as the auteur, like I'm the author of the movie. So she kind of stripped that from him in her book. And I know it deeply affected Orson. He was horrified, partly because he made money off of that book. He sold or he licensed the script to Kane, to the publisher, Little Brown. And they were trying to find a way to publish it, and that was their way with the Pauline Kael book. So he found himself indirectly in business with a woman <laughs> who was trying to take away some of his credit. And then oh, wow. Peter Bogdanovich wrote a scathing uh, attack on Kale, going point by point, ripping apart her thesis. Wow. For, I, I think, Vanity Fair... Oh, interesting, yeah. Oh, the other thing, actually, we should mention about the film, uh, Greg Toland, who was one of the very highly rated uh, cameramen, and Orson's story is that Toland contacted him and said, I want to work on your film, and Orson said, why? I don't know anything about making films. He said, that's why. So um, <laughs> I don't know if it's Orson's phrase or someone's talked about the confidence of ignorance. Yeah, it was Orson's, is, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is a thing, isn't it? It is. If you don't think about something too much and you don't read too many of the rules... If you're a bit of a maverick right. anyway, it's going to help that, not knowing what you should be doing. Right. I'm sure, uh, listeners, you could find many a podcast reviewing Citizen Kane. So <laughs> we've given you about 15 minutes there. <laughs> now, another bit of his life, I would like to focus mostly on the films from now. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's other stuff. The bit of his life that I had no idea about was um, all this political work. Oh, yeah. Now, of course, I'm looking back at Kane and I'm thinking, was there a politician already there? Or was the work on Kane, did that inspire Orson to become, I wouldn't call him a politician, but I guess he was political. What I've got, late November 1941, so this is the same year that Kane came out, Wells was appointed as a goodwill ambassador to Latin America by Nelson Rockefeller, US coordinator of inter-American affairs and a principal stockholder in RKO Radio Pictures. It was a cultural diplomacy mission. Now, again, I need you to just clear something up for me. So, Wells was commissioned to produce a documentary of the annual Rio Carnival, as it's called in Portuguese, Mm -hmm. Carnival, in February. Another thing Orson said that I'm not sure I totally buy, he was given a a million dollars for this. Now, maybe he was, but a million dollars in 1941, that's a hell of a lot of change. Yes. What do we know about that? Well, I mean, the footage from that exists. There's a great documentary about the making of that film and how it was not well received when the footage came back. It was the, you know, the old kind of racist, what are we, what are you doing here? You know, it's a bunch of, yeah. I'm not even going to use the expression, but I know that it wound up being a much more expensive 
creatively expensive uh, trip than he bargained for because it was while he was filming It's All True, that movie, that Ambersons was taken away from him in the editing That's stages. Right. It was the beginning, though, of this... I don't know if I would call it a political career either, but I know that he did have that friendship with FDR, and I know that there were people encouraging Orson to get more politically active. Orson began writing a column for a newspaper, Mm. and then eventually he had these commentaries, which are interesting to listen to. I sent you one the other day about Mm. racism. Usually they were specific about some specific news story, and they're interesting to listen to because he sounds like, he's like a political commentator today, more like editorializing, but you know, in a very erudite and uh, genteel way. (laughs) Mm. But he is tackling issues, you know, like racism, for example, where what he's saying in 1946 wouldn't have been out of place in 1962. Mm. It's the sort of thing we're hearing. This is Orson Welles. I've spoken these words before, but not on the radio. To be born free is to be born in debt. To live in freedom without fighting slavery is to profiteer. On my plane last night, I flew over some parts of our republic where American citizenship is a luxury beyond the means of the majority. I rode comfortably in my plane above a sovereign state or two where fellow countrymen of ours can't vote without the privilege of cash. I bought my breakfast this morning where Negroes may not come except to serve their white brothers. And there I overheard a member of some master race or other tell those who listened that something must be done to suppress the Jews. I have met Southerners who expect and fear a Negro insurrection. I see no purpose in withholding this from general discussion. There may be those within that outcast 10% of the American people who someday will strike back at their oppressors. But to put down that mob, a mob would rise. I'd like to ask, please, who will put down that mob? The scaly dinosaurs of reaction, if indeed they notice what I'm speaking here, will say in their newspapers that I'm a communist. Communist, no otherwise. I'm an overpaid movie producer with pleasant reasons to rejoice, and I do, in the wholesome practicability of the profit system. But surely my right to having more than enough is cancelled if I don't use that more to help those who have less. My subject today is the question of moral indebtedness. So I'd like to acknowledge here the debt that goes with ownership. I believe, and this has very much to do with my own notion of freedom, I believe... I owe the very profit I make to the people I make it from. If this is radicalism, it comes automatically to most of us in show business. It being generally agreed that any public man owes his position to the public. That's what I mean when I say I'm your obedient servant. But it never went anywhere. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know, because of what happened with funding of his films and finding more work in Europe. I don't know what happened, but... You know, he Mm. spent a lot of time away from the country after that. Yeah, just before we carry on with that, because there's some stuff he did during the war as well, campaigning for Roosevelt. I've watched The Magnificent Ambersons once, and that came out the year after Kane. And I I probably suffered this syndrome of its great reputation. I know that the end of it was taken away from him, as you've already mentioned, because he was off in Rio. I wasn't too mad on the rest of it, but I've only seen it once. Maybe I should watch it again. But um, how many times have you seen that film? What's your general view on that one? I've seen it twice, Ambersons. I know mm. it starts off wonderfully well, and I know it's an era that Orson loves to, or loved to explore. And it's a time period that Orson really loved. And he has said, whether or not it's true, that his father was friendly with the author. I think is Booth Tarkington who wrote the book, The Magnificent Ambersons. It was one of Orson's favorite books. He said that what happened to that film is the great sadness of his life, but it's more than just the ending because the shooting script exists and there is actually someone now. There's two things going on with Ambersons right now. One of them is an animator who is taking the existing Ambersons footage and trying to animate the parts that are missing. 
And it's an interesting project that's been ongoing for a number of years. And the other thing that's happening is somewhere down in Brazil, there's a documentary crew who are making a, a film about the search for the missing Ambersons footage. Mm-hmm. From what I understand, it's such a compromised movie that what exists is, I don't know, maybe 60% of what Orson originally envisioned. envisioned. It's mm-hmm. one of many compromised uh, projects, but this is one where we're just missing so many sequences. So it's kind of hard to judge this movie. It's interesting that you said they're, they're doing a, a kind of a making off because he made a making off with Othello. Yeah. The other side of the wind has, has got that sense of it. I mm-hmm. think Orson was very tapped into, we'll probably expand on this later, very tapped into the idea that nothing is real almost, to quote yes. the Beatles podcast. <laughs> right. <laughs> or a Lennon lyric, in fact. Yeah. There's a very fine line between what you're seeing, the process of making the film, what you're seeing in the final film, and what you could have been seeing. You know, there's a difference between those things. I knew the story behind it before I watched the film. I suppose if you didn't know the story, you might see it and go, what is this all about? It just, this is just seems like a movie that doesn't really go anywhere. But mm. I'd always known the story, so I, I came into that film with all of that information, and I spent most of that film looking for cuts, you know, looking for things that, oh, I see what's missing and what should have been there or whatever. So I never really got to experience it as audiences experience. It was actually a very successful film from what I understand. People really enjoyed it at the time and it made a lot of money. But it was a great sadness for Orson as Peter Bogdanovich. Even when it came on television, Orson was like, oh, I'll be in the other room. I don't even want to be in the room while this is playing. As you said, it'd be a bit of a recurring theme as we go on, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Let's just uh, go back to this political uh, activity of his. And uh, again, I'll just read from Wikipedia and again, put me right if any of this is wrong. On the recommendation of President Franklin D. Roosevelt, Secretary of the Treasury Henry Morgan Thal asked Wells to lead the Fifth War Loan Drive, which opened uh, June the 12th, 44, with a one-hour radio show. So as we've seen, you know, the radio career hasn't gone away. It's still there. You mentioned as well, he did the Jack Benny. Was that radio or? Was that radio? Yes, radio. That's mm-hmm. radio. radio. Okay. The program defined the causes of the war and encouraged Americans to buy $16 billion in bonds to finance the Normandy landings in the most violent phase of World War II. Wells produced additional war loan drive broadcasts from the Hollywood Bowl and from Soldiers Field, Chicago. Wells campaigned ardently for Roosevelt in 1944. Oh, this is good. He occasionally sent the president ideas and phrases that were sometimes incorporated into what Wells characterized as less important speeches. <laughs> so I don't know. When were the fireside chats? What years were those? Do I don't know? remember the years, but that would have been around that time. You can imagine Orson uh, writing a fireside chat. He'd know what to do, I feel like. Right. <laughs> and mention the dog. People like the dog. Yeah. Who was yeah. this dog? <laughs> Flicker? But well, there was the dog, I think. Flicker. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know much about FDR, apart from the bare bones. Wells campaigned for the Roosevelt Truman, that's Harry Truman, obviously took over, ticket almost full-time in the fall of 1944, travelling to nearly every state to the detriment of his own health and at his own expense. Have you heard heard about that before? That one I hadn't, no. I mean, I knew about the Mm. relationship with Roosevelt, and I know that he was being encouraged to run for senator, and Orson, again, I don't know if this is true, that... His opponent would have been Joe McCarthy. Oh, Do you know about been, that? That would have been tasty. I'd have bought a ticket right. for that. Yeah. I think I'd heard something about that. Uh, the only other thing I've got here, Wells accompanied FDR to his last campaign rally, speaking at an event November the 4th at Boston's Fenway Park before 40,000 people and took part in a historic Election Eve campaign broadcast November the 6th on all four radio networks. I'd never heard anything about this. Well, I probably have because I've read two biographies of him, but... What flashed through my mind? Fenway Park. I just keep keep thinking these are all places that Paul McCartney's played recently. <laughs> <laughs> Soldier Field. She, oh, right. the, you know. Yeah. So that's a that's a tangent. We won't go on. Places where Paul McCartney's played recently. <laughs> Shea Stadium. <laughs> yeah. Also, in a way, seems like a born politician. In the as I said, I feel like he would know exactly what to say. But do you think? Do we do we know anything about what his political? leanings were i feel like a bit like brando and a couple of other people he might have seen through the whole two-party thing do we know anything about his politics all i know is that generally he would i mean he himself referred to his own political views as progressive 
or left leaning. Okay. So I mm. think he probably would have been a lifelong Democrat. I don't know if he would have been somebody who was that keen to uh, look beyond the two party system because he was such mm. so loyal to FDR. I'm not quite sure. His attitude might have changed because once he goes to Europe, we really don't hear anything about once he spends most of his time in Europe, you know, we really don't hear anything about his opinion on much of anything in politics. But I don't know if when he went to Europe that he had an interest in politics in Europe. Uh, I, I know that primarily it was he was involved in American politics and that seemed mm. to be where his career was going. Mm. And certainly with the encouragement of FDR and a bunch of other folks who saw him as possibly becoming a senator from Wisconsin or Illinois. But once he departed for Europe, I'm sure he did have an interest in, you know, the politics of Europe as opposed to the United States. It just seemed that he was mm. so focused on American politics. But once he, I don't want to say fled the country, but once mm. he left the country, I never really heard him return to American politics only with regret that he didn't uh, go up against Senator Joe McCarthy and with the assumption that he would have won because he could have lost too and the uh, House Un-American Activities Commission could have happened anyway. Well, the word mercurial is always bandied around for people like him. Of course, it's a bit mm. of a pun on... Didn't mean it as a pun on Mercury. Oh, but, there right. you go. <laughs> but do you feel like perhaps a bit like Brando, maybe he was very invested in causes and then would move on? Because that's a bit of a, it's a bit of a John Lennon thing as well, definitely. Yeah. One of the times we were on Glass Onion, do you remember when somebody asked about John Lennon's relationship to the Irish situation, the IRA? I don't know if you remember that. When we did the audio questions. Yeah, I don't think it's just that these people abandon things because they get bored. I think that's a bit too simple. I think maybe they realise what a total minefield it is. The thing I was going to say, I, I do remember I made the point when someone asked that question, that, you know, to be involved in politics... And to really understand these issues, you know, that's a pretty full-time gig, really. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't just sort of flit in and out. So I wonder, you know, and I, I see a bit of myself in that, you know, I've had occasions where, you know, I have a certain enthusiasm for something and I go full bore and maybe I burn it out. Do you ever get that with yourself? Yeah, I wonder. And then you have to think, is there value in that? Is there value in the case of, say, a John Lennon or an Orson being 100% committed at that mm. moment, and then you've ex you've pretty much expended all of your energy and all the energy you're going to expend thinking about the problem, trying to come up with a resolution, and now mm. you're you're finished with that. You just don't have what it takes to continue <laughs> thinking about that, and you move on to something else. I think it does have value, but you know you have to wait. I guess you have to measure it against somebody who's totally and utterly committed and focused to one thing and one thing only. And they're going to be consistent throughout the remainder of their life. Does that have more value? But then that other person is maybe not going to jump around and tackle all these other various different topics well, that are happening. You've just described Billy Bragg perfectly. <laughs> well done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that is a perfect example. I think, when, right. uh, I think John Stewart, you know, that guy who wrote that book, Dylan Lennon, Marks and God, mm -hmm. when he was on uh, Glass Onions, I'm sort of stealing his line. He said, yeah, that's Billy Bragg, you know, just the same all the time. Consistent. Right. And I think society does like a plodder in some... They're easier yeah. to handle, aren't they? Because <laughs> they're more predictable. Right. I mean, I, I don't know if any of this political stuff... Oh, as you said, that radio show exists that you did with FDR. In the case mm -hmm. of John Lennon, I quite like Sometime in New York City. Not all of it's great. But I think in the case of John Lennon, because everything was filmed and everything right. was recorded on audio, he said enough very interesting and provocative things that it does have merit, you know. I mean, the stuff he sure. said during the bedding about things like drugs and stuff, because he knew about that, I think it does have merit because these guys, you know, they have an ability to come up with a killer line. So, you know, right. I'm not having to go at Billy Bragg because I, I admire his dedication, but he might spend, you know, five albums coming up with um, political wisdom. Right. And John Lennon might say it in two lines, you know. Yeah. Just give you a little example. One of my favourite songs of his is God and Arthur Yanoff who he did the primal therapy with, said, oh, you know, we were talking about God. And then John Lennon said, oh, yeah, God is a concept by which we measure our pain. And Yanov said, oh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> it's this ability to distill it into right. one line. And I don't know exactly what that means, but to answer your question, it's definitely got impact. Well, yeah. then the other, the other thing is, 
we talk about these things being filmed and so in the case of Lennon the fact that he might have he might have tackled one issue and felt one way at one particular time does have merit because that piece of film just continues year after year after year after year. So people discover it, and it it does create the impression that he was always obsessed with whatever, let's say, drug legislation in the United States. Yeah. Even though he, even though he might <laughs> yeah. have talked about it once, <laughs> yeah. that piece of film just it's like uh, it's constantly generating interest. It's out there almost as uh, his proxy doing his work for him. So he, he, he only has to say it the one time. Yeah. Unlike Billy Bragg, he doesn't have to do five albums, not to pick on Billy Bragg. He can just yeah. have that one piece of film that's just going to spread that message, you know, for the next 60 years. I think he, John Lennon even said that, you know, that it's used as a sort of stick to beat him with, but it works the opposite way. You know, if he said something amazing, even something that wasn't his line, because apparently life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans, wasn't his line. Right. I think it was stolen from somewhere else, but, you know, who cares? John Lennon, ah, oh, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. What a genius. <laughs> you know, I'm obviously a fan. I've done 100 right. episodes or more. Correct me if I'm wrong. Doesn't that come from a sort of... S- kind of syrupy self-help book or something? Well, yes, I did a bit of research about this. You were nearly right. It's a guy called Alan Saunders, who was a journalist and a cartoonist, and it was in the January 1957 issue of Reader's Digest. <laughs> Let's say you wouldn't a million miles away. It was life is what happens to us while we're making other plans. I think perhaps uh, in terms of John Lennon in that sense, perhaps someone should have mentioned that it was based on something else, not necessarily him. And, of course, he didn't have much time because it was only a couple of months that he was alive after the album right. came out. But, yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with, uh, obviously, taking something that already exists and then tweaking it a little bit. And no. it's within the context of a song, of course. More egregious than that was uh, The Inner Light, you know, the George Harrison Beatles right. song. Without going out of your door, you can see... Without going out of your door, you can see the ways of heaven right. arrive without travelling. That's all completely taken from a... Um, it must be a Hindu text. Yeah. Maybe Buddhist text. But hey. And if there's any Led Zeppelin fans listening, <laughs> look up that first album. You know, there's so much now on, on YouTube. There's a great documentary I always recommend to everyone called Everything is a Remix. Just to talk about, you know, taking bits from other places and, and assimilating them. So, yeah, you reckon Orson, after the FDR stuff, we didn't really hear much from him politically at all after that? I'd have to look, but they don't really spring to mind. At that point, Mm. he just seemed to be interviewed about his own work all the time. Mm. I don't think people were really looking for him. You would probably find something like that in his daughter's book, In My Father's Shadow, where she talks about traveling the world with him, going to meet up with him wherever he was, and he would take her to some museum or some, or mausoleum or so. He would always Mm. have an insider somewhere. He would know someone everywhere. So Mm. it would be like, um, come with me, my daughter. We're going to visit. This is the tomb of an ancient king. I happen to know the man who sweeps the floor, so he's given me the key. (laughs) We're going to have, you know, or it would be... um, here we are. This is the the study of a of a great uh, 18th century poet, and I know the man who bought the house, so he's given me the access to go. So he had a lot of access other people didn't. Yeah, I can well believe that he would have contacts because he's obviously yeah he'd obviously travelled to different places, and I can feel I can imagine him charming people. You know, yes, maybe not having deep friendships with people, but having contacts everywhere. Just very quickly, because uh, we're gonna mostly focus on the films from here on do you know the story of robert shaw renting a house from orson and setting it on fire not deliberately no <laughs> it's an exclusive for you ghosty robert shaw once rented orson wells's house and set it on fire yeah i think it was in uh, spain so he must have been sh- orson okay. had a house in spain is that right i think so yes i feel like he did in fact he said in an interview he did that is apparently a true story. and it's, it's so gloriously random, I thought I'd just put it in here. Um, Robert Shaw is one of my favourite actors. I feel like in the future I might well do a deep dive on him because he's a fascinating character. It relates to Wilson's production he did of Moby Dick because he did a theatre production. Yes. It took place originally at the Duke of York's Theatre in London, I've got here. Wells filmed about 75 minutes, then abandoned it, not happy with the results. 
The film was lost when a drunken Robert Shaw was smoking in bed at Wells's house in Madrid. The house burned down along with the only copy of the film. Hmm. Now, of course, we're not laughing at the fact that the house burned down, but it is unbelievably, uh, it's so weird, isn't it? <laughs> Bizarrely random. And Orson Welles did actually mention Robert Shaw in passing on one of the Dick Cavett interviews. I don't remember what he said, but he did mention him. It seems like there was an epidemic of people smoking in bed and falling asleep <laughs> throughout this period because it's the actor Jack Cassidy died. I think he fell asleep on a couch with a lit cigarette and set the house on fire. Oh, my God. Well, there was a massive fire at a football stadium soccer stadium in the mid 80s it's, mm. it's horrendous and that that came from a cigarette as well and the king's cross fire one of the reasons you can't smoke in uh, tube stations in london is because someone dropped a cigarette in a bin and uh, caused a massive fire at king's cross let's uh, bring the mood up shall we okay <laughs> <laughs> i have one it's okay, the, the desi arnez story desi arnez contacted Orson about doing a television program for his studio, Desilu, or he and mm. Lucille Ball's studio, Desilu. And at that time, Orson was in kind of a bad way, so he was living with uh, Desi Arnaz in his uh, house. I'm trying to uh, think if I have all the facts right here, but Desi gave him a certain amount of money, a studio space to get a project going. And... Apparently nothing was done. Weeks would go on and uh, really nothing was happening. And Desi was going to come there down to the studio and let Orson know, you know, I want to com come and see the progress and what's happening. And mm. uh, when he opened up the soundstage, instead there was a gigantic and elaborate party <laughs> that was oh. being thrown in Desi Arnaz's honor with the money that he had given Orson. <laughs> oh my God. I thought you were going to say Orson was on the beach waiting for the right wave. No. Was it? <laughs> no. Was it, it was sort of oh. a, here's where all of the money went for a party. Have a great you. party. <laughs> right. So you get the idea. Right. Yeah. But he would have delivered it with just enough charm that the right. honest wouldn't have killed him. Yeah. What we're going to talk about now, guys, is uh, the post. Citizen Kane films, or maybe we should say the post Ambersons films, because we already talked about that. I didn't watch as many of these as I would have liked to, but I did. Uh, I watched uh, one of the films and rewatched two of them. There, there were some acting gigs as well, such as Jane Eyre, sure, Journey into Fear. But can we talk about The Stranger? Yeah, I'm going to potentially upset you in case you really like this film. I watched it once. I didn't mind it, but I did write in my notes mid-level Hitchcock, which isn't a bad thing. <laughs> What I got from it, it, it did very much resemble a Hitchcock film of that period. And I think maybe the influence was both ways, because uh, that bell tower sequence at the end, you know, Hitchcock must have seen that and uh, influenced Vertigo, didn't it? This was the same year as Notorious. I thought the premise was really good, and Edward G. Robinson's always good. I just didn't think the script was that great, and uh, some of the acting was of a, a certain 1940s type. If you'd like to take me to task, go ahead. No, What's not your necessarily. Opinion? What's your opinion of The Stranger? I don't think The Stranger's like a top-tier Wells movie, although we don't mm. really have that many movies to put mm. it against, really. But when you think about it, four years since he directed a film, there's a big layoff there. He was acting in other movies, and he was working in the Hollywood system, but Orson said that he took this job to prove that he didn't glow in the dark. In <laughs> other words, to make a movie that would be acceptable to a Hollywood studio on time, under budget. But, of course, this was also hacked by editors, too, because there's a whole other sequence, I believe, in South America that's missing from this film mm -hmm. in the very beginning. Originally, Orson's idea was to have Agnes Moorhead come to town and out Franz Kindler. That was his character, right? The, the studio disagreed and wanted Edward G. Robinson. Orson thought it would have been better if it was an old spinster who came to town and uncovered yeah. this uh, story. But, you know... He went along with it. I agree. I don't think it's his strongest work. Unfortunately, it's one of those movies that... I mean, I don't think it's bad, but it's one of those mm. movies that slipped into the public domain. And in the United States, certainly for a time in the 80s, if you walked into a video store, this and Mr. Ocardin would be the Orson Welles movies you would find two for nine ninety nine on VHS right. all the time. Just to say one thing, Agnes Moorhead, of course, played his mother in Citizen Kane. 
Mm -hmm. uh, if people wanted to know who she was. I said it came out the same year as Notorious. And of course, Notorious had uh, the Nazi element as well. Ingrid Bergman's married to a, a Nazi. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's hard to put into words. I mean, it's, it's, it's not terrible. But like I say, the script, it didn't really have any particularly kind of biting lines in it. And I just didn't buy him as... They, I think they say, they say he's the inventor of the term genocide. Possibly. It's did. been a while since I've seen it. There are some nice things in it. I do like Definitely. Edward G. Mm. Robinson going into the small town and talking to the chemist. And I did mm. like those scenes probably more than most in here. What's interesting about this movie is if you're a fan of Orson Arcana, I guess if that's a word, there's lots of references to the Todd School for Boys in this movie. Ah, he slipped it in. He, has, he uses the name of a teacher. Since we're talking about a school, he used from mm. his own experience. I think there's even a banner for the Todd School for Boys promoting like a football match. Yeah, there were some football guys. I remember that. Mm -hmm. They're in the woods, aren't they? Yeah. One very interesting thing is that I think it had a footage of the death camps, didn't it? Was that actually Auschwitz, do we know? I'm not sure. But it was definitely footage of um, the death camps. It's credible, really, because this is 1946, the year after the war finished. Maybe it was even shot in 45, I don't know. But that was, a, that was definitely something of interest. Do you remember the, the clock tower scene? Oh, of course. You can't tell me that Hitchcock wouldn't have seen that and been influenced for Vertigo, because it's very, well, very similar. Yeah, I mean, this movie is a bit of a, bit of a pot boiler. There's no, no question mm. about it. I don't think it's top tier Wells. That scene is memorable. You know, you talk about the acting that I, I really enjoy actually that 1940s acting, that heightened reality of. So I don't have a problem with that in terms of, I mean, I, I try to live my daily life like that with that heightened reality. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have an issue with that per se, but I do have an issue with that clock tower scene in that it's so over the top, especially the fall, which looks a little ridiculous. Yeah. It's well-directed, but I don't think it's that great a story. It's, it's the kind of movie mm. you would put on on a Sunday afternoon when you've got nothing, <laughs> nothing to mm -hmm. do, and you're like, oh, yeah, I'll watch this. Edward G. Robinson, I like him. Orson Welles, I like him. Okay, you know, we'll give yeah. it a shot. Yeah, Edward G. Robinson, this is two years after Double Indemnity, which is a huge favorite of mine. And he's doing something quite similar. I guess he's doing a kind of Edward G. Robinson thing, which is everything is done with a kind of, Slight smile on his face. That's something I love about his acting. I haven't seen I a whole see, load of his films, but... Key Largo, of course, he's wonderful in that. I'm, I'm oh, sure you've I've seen never that seen movie. that. No, I haven't oh, seen that. Oh, that's actually. great. There's a great story that Orson tells where he is directing... It's a dinner scene with Edward G. Robinson and then Loretta Young sitting at the edge, end of the table. Mm. And Edward G. Robinson was in a foul mood all day. And Orson finally asked him, you know, why are you in such a poor mood? And Edward G. Robinson said, all right, you keep shooting me on my bad side. Mm -hmm. And Orson was like, can you imagine Edward G. Robinson thinking that there was a good side? <laughs> 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 anyway. But yeah, definitely, um, I would not say curiosity, because that, that sounds a bit patronizing. I'd say it's worth, worth watching, certainly, you know, if you're an Orson Welles completist, for sure. I think next up we've got The Lady from Shanghai. Now, I haven't actually seen this. I did manage to watch a few clips. But, of course, the big thing with this is um, it's got Rita Hayworth in it. You listen to that podcast. You must remember this, don't you? Mm-hmm. Karina Longworth. I just listened to the episode. Rita Hayworth obviously had a pretty tragic early life. And it's just, to me, like, not knowing that much about her, she seems like a bit of a tragic character. But I believe their marriage was kind of on the rocks when they made this. But tell us about the film and then... Uh, any of the making of stuff you got? Well, the story behind this film is that Orson was doing a play in New York. I want to say it was Around the World in 80 Days on Broadway. And he had called up Harry Kahn at uh, Columbia and said, I'm going to direct a picture for you if you wire me this money. So they, their costumes were being held somewhere and they needed money in order to get them out of customs or whatever. And the story. Now, again, this is one of those stories that Orson told later in life. I doubt whether there's 100% truth in the story, mm. that he was at a drugstore making this call, and he reached over and grabbed a book on a rack and said, oh, yeah, there's a book right. here, The Man I Killed. I will direct this. I think this is one of the great <laughs> stories. I'm going to direct this picture for you. And Rita Hayworth is going to be in it. with. And, of course, he got the money. Mm. 
it was my understanding, reading background on this film, that Rita Hayworth did this film, and she wanted to do it. One, she wanted to work with Orson Welles as a director, but also she was mm. hoping that this film would save their marriage, which right. it didn't quite do. I will say that Orson has said that Rita Hayworth was the only genuinely kind person he ever knew. In Hollywood or at all? I guess at all or in Hollywood. Mm, like, right. Or one of the, the nicest person or the most genuinely kind person he ever met. Mm. You're not going to find anything negative ever said about Rita Hayworth, apparently. This is another flawed film. You know, much like The Stranger, The Stranger... Its reputation almost rests solely on that clock tower scene with the lady from Shanghai. The reputation to this film rests solely on the House of Mirrors scene toward the yeah. end, which is what it's famous for. There are problems with this. This is another one with horrendous editing, and this kind of becomes a hallmark. At this point, this is, I think, studio interference, per se, but I know that in other movies, Orson himself is, is kind of a problem with the editing, but... This is an odd movie. We're sort of getting into this territory where Orson becomes a director that you could see influencing someone like David Lynch. We're getting into a little more surrealism with uh, this movie, The Lady from Shanghai. Yeah. This is also not one of my favorites. He does kind of this ridiculous Irish accent that goes yeah. in and out. Sometimes it sounds pretty good. Sometimes it's horrendous. <laughs> yeah, can I just comment on that? Yeah, that was another thing. I mean, I, I, I don't like abandoning films for what you might call slightly trivial reasons, but it's similar to... Um, we did a special about Michael Caine last year for his 90th birthday. We had talk about the Cider House Rules, which he won an Oscar for, which is a... Yeah, it's not a bad film at all, but everyone was saying, oh, his American accent's so good, and Scott and I were saying, well, no, it isn't. <laughs> and it, it took me out the performance, but virtually the whole thing, because it's just an impression of an American accent. And yeah, like you said, it's yeah, I, I just couldn't quite get past it from the bits I, I watched. There seemed to be some really interesting stuff going on. It's nice in a way that we can access all this stuff, because again, I'd definitely say to a Wells fan, I'd say I haven't seen it all the way through, but it would be one that's worth watching once, wouldn't you say? You know. Yeah, I, I, it also fits into that film noir genre. Mm. I think there are far more successful film noir movies out there, even you know low budget film noirs that are better than this. Mm. But there are some interesting ideas in this film. I don't think it quite comes off. Well, this is kind of what I'm saying. Yeah, nowadays it's worth watching once because you might get two or three bits from it. Particularly right. if you're, a fi I mean, I'm not a filmmaker, but if you're a film student or something, I'm sure there's a couple of camera angles there and a couple of ideas. Particularly if you read up on it, because I did read up on the film a bit. With Brando, you know, even if he makes an absolute turkey, there might be like one look right. he gives or one way he delivers a certain line. And you go, oh, the film's almost worth watching just for that, you know. <laughs> well, there's a scene, I mean, what's, what sticks with me is not necessarily Rita Hayworth, who's blonde, we should say, in this movie, mm. which, was, which was controversial at the time because she was known for her flowing red hair and to mm. chop it off and make it blonde. I mean, he, she's shot really beautifully. I mean, she looks fantastic in the, in the film. But there's a scene where the character that Orson is hired to kill, he's actually hiring him to kill himself. The way that scene is shot is very bizarre. It's just memorable in the sense, I can't really explain it, but the guy's, uh, the actor, I forget his name, is saying, I want you to kill me with a big smile on his face. And it's just so unnerving and unsettling. And Everett Sloan is in this movie, uh, although yeah. that's not the character. But Everett Sloan is wonderful in this. He was in Citizen Kane. He's yeah. one of Orson's main players from the Mercury Theater. And I don't think I've ever seen Everett Sloan be bad in anything. I mean, I think he's just a tremendous character actor that's, it's not fair. He's just a tremendous actor, but because he's not a leading man type, he's overlooked. Yeah. By the yeah, way, this is him. this has got nothing to do with anything. But you mentioned Brando. Have you seen any of the photos from the Brando biopic that's being made with actor Billy Zane playing Marlon Brando? Yeah, and I again, uh, unless someone watches it and tells me it's absolutely amazing, I'm probably going to give it a miss. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm kind of fed up with all these biopics <laughs> after that Elvis one and uh, you know, all these Beatles <laughs> ones that are coming out. I'll just watch Marlon instead. But. I don't know, what do you think about it? I didn't even know that there was going to be a Brando biopic. 
And what angle are they approaching this from? I mean, because I see him doing Mutiny on the Bounty, and I see him, hmm. uh, Billy Zane, dressed up as Brando as Paul from Last Tango in Paradise. I'm like, what are they doing, a whole life story of oh. Marlon Brando? And anyway, I mean, Billy Zane does resemble him. I will give him that. I mean, it's pretty good hmm. casting, but I have to hear Billy Zane do the voice. <laughs> I, 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 mean, I don't the, know. Yeah, I mean, the example I always give is the Ali film, you know, the Michael Mann film. Will mm-hmm. Smith did as well as you could possibly do. He looked like him. He had all the mannerisms. But at the end of the day, all the fights are on YouTube, so you don't need to watch recreations. Right, and right. There's so much Ali stuff, and nowadays there's so much of all this, everyone, you know, Lennon, Brando, whoever it is. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, I'll probably give that one a swerve. When you said what angle, I was thinking, no, Marlon, maybe upper woman's skirt, perhaps. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, is it going to be like, you know, is it going to take the tragic, unfulfilled promise of Brando or, you know, it's kind of yeah. it kind of ties into the, the it's sort of the the story of Orson. I disagree with that, the tragic, mm. unfulfilled promise of Orson. But anyway, want to yes. move on to uh, yes, yes. Macbeth? Yeah, Macbeth, I think this is late 40s. I've just got a couple of notes. Small shooting schedule and a small budget, kind of a B-picture style. I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but I feel like Orson just had this real connection to Shakespeare, which I do to some extent. I mean, we were kind of force-fed it at school, you know, mm-hmm. which I think has the effect of turning kids off Shakespeare, the fact that they're forced to um, study the plays and stuff. We studied Macbeth, in fact, at school. Yes. And um, there's another... Uh, well, there's two more Shakespeare adaptations, which we'll get to in a minute, but I haven't re-watched this... Um, again, the accent's just a bit of a problem. It's not terrible, but... Well, it depends which version, because there's two versions. There's oh, one right. where they're attempting Scottish accents. That's the one that's been restored. I think prior oh, to right. that, the whole movie was dubbed. I really enjoy this version of Macbeth. I like it because of the low budget, although you could argue Orson deserved better and this is an indignity or whatever, but because of that low budget, it resembles the stage production. So I would imagine that if Orson had been hired to put together a stage production of Macbeth, in short order, this is what it would look like. I really enjoy it. I mean, you can't fault the script. (laughs) You know, Mm. I mean, the play itself is wonderful. I was also force-fed Shakespeare, but I never had any issues with that. I was always delighted. And Mm. Macbeth was one of my favorite um, Shakespeare plays. In fact, this is something hardly anyone, I don't think anyone would really know about this, what I'm about to tell you. This is a Mm. deep, dark secret. In that early 20s kind of, I'm going to be the Orson Welles of New Jersey mentality that I was uh, fully enjoying, (laughs) Mm. I decided I was going to put on for radio a one-man Macbeth where I was going to play all of the parts. (laughs) Wow. Including Lady Macbeth, and I was going yeah. to do it with a full, you know, sound effects and music and the whole bit. I didn't get very far with this idea, but I remember telling people about this, and they would look at me like I was insane. First of all, why would anyone? The only reason that anyone would want to hear that is because this is just stupid concept. You'd you'd have curiosity, but I like these podcasts are a kind of uh, a place for you to uh, reveal your. Yeah. I mean, this makes the COVID was the best year of my life. Comments seem <laughs> far less controversial. Than I've got another one coming up. Anyway. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll look forward to that. <laughs> just to briefly mention, I, I ended up with a free Apple TV six-month subscription that's just uh, finished. still don't know actually how I got it. I just got an email saying congratulations. I watched the one uh, Tragedy of Macbeth, directed by one of the Cohen brothers, not both. And mm-hmm. it's pretty good, yeah. Denzel Washington is Macbeth. There's quite a lot of black actors in the cast, but what's quite nice about it is that it doesn't make any difference to my experience. And I say that meaning not good or bad, which is frankly the way it should be. Weirdly enough, Frances McDormand, although she's a fantastic actress, I actually found her breakdown as Lady Macbeth the least convincing part of it. Hmm. But um, it's, it's pretty interesting production. Whenever I watch a Shakespeare adaptation, I generally put the subtitles on because I've come to appreciate Shakespeare more and more as I get older. And uh, the lines, if you want to call it that, are just fabulous, you know. uh, So that's worth having a look at. There's obviously been some great Shakespeare adaptations over the years. End of part two.